Help support the Candid Frame in bringing you awesome conversations with great photographers. You can do this by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. That modest donation helps us to bring a quality show to you every week. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. This is Ibarian X, and this is the candid frame. If you are of a certain generation, the photographs that first made an impression on you might have been published in Life or Look magazines. Those publications showcased some of the best photography to ever be published, be it photojournalism, fashion, or portraiture. Many of those images still stand out to this day. But for others, including myself, the photographs that captured our imaginations were album covers. I well remember sitting at the foot of my dad's record player, rifling through the albums and choosing my favorites, not based on what I heard, but rather what I saw. When music was sold on vinyl discs, the album cover was king. It was not only a way to market the music, but it was an art form unto itself. And there were few photographers more adept at this than Guy Webster, a photographer who helped craft covers for the likes of The Doors, The Rolling Stones, Herb Albert, and The Mamas and The Papas. Guy was of the same generation of many of the people that he photographed, whether they were rock stars or movie stars. But despite his youth, he was savvy enough to figure out how to disarm someone and achieve the best photograph possible especially when faced with a notoriously rambunctious young rock group called the Rolling Stones. First of all, I grew up in show business at movies, and I watched how directors worked. And alone with the actor, they could get a lot more than if he's in the group. And I watched that. That was so interesting to me. And so I got the Rolling Stones, well, and the Doors in my studio, And I said, look, I'm going to do individual portraits first. And when I did, they were disarmed. They were so used to being a group for protection, joking around with the group and being needled by the group. It kept them laughing and all that. So I got, I started with Mick and I got him to relax and shoot. And I have this great picture that's up there on the wall of Mick that I love when we were both 19 years old. He enjoyed decades of success, photographing some of the most famous faces in the entertainment industry, all the while accumulating one of the largest private collections of motorcycles in the world. But three years ago, a stroke almost killed him. And though he lived through it, it made it physically impossible for him to make photographs and to ride his beloved motorcycles. But undeterred, he worked hard to regain his mobility and strength and return to making photographs. When you have a stroke, your left arm doesn't work. Your left leg doesn't work. You have to make it work. Walking without help with this walker took me two years. Getting in and out of the car took me another six months. So all these things are on the way to healing. And in my life coming up, I will heal. We'll talk to Guy about some memorable stories growing up and working in Hollywood and about his stint as a magazine publisher for his seminal magazine, Wet. And later I'll talk about a photograph that I love that was inspired not by light or gesture, but a sound. Welcome to The Candid Frame. Well, Guy... Thank you for uh, making time for me this morning. I really appreciate it. Happy to do it. Uh, as I was telling you earlier, it's really kind of funny because when I was doing research on you and looking at all your photographs and I saw all those album covers, I went, oh, I know this picture. I know this album cover. Because as a kid, I would sit down next next to my dad's record player, which he forbid me to ever touch. And I would just go through those album covers and I think even before I realized I was a, a photographer, I was fascinated by the pictures and looking at all those album covers and realizing how many of those were yours 
was really kind of a, a treat having a chance to get to, to, to meet the man behind the picture. So thank you. I, I'm so happy to do it, tell you all about it. And I have lots of stories. I can do this for hours. <laughs> so be careful. Wow. Oh, well. You know, what's really interesting about your life and your career is that your dad was a composer for motion pictures. And so you grew up in Beverly Hills amidst you know the whole, that whole era of you know musical performers, actors, and their kids, and you're known for the work that you produced during sort of the tail end of that era during the '50s and the early '60s, and then transitioning into you know that that era that it was made famous by so many people. And I always found it I found it really fascinating this idea that unlike other photographers who made themselves famous by documenting the same things, a lot of those people came from outside of that. But you sort of came in from the inside. And I think that that probably provided you a perspective yeah. that was unlike anyone, anyone else had ever that, that, uh, that came through and, and made, their, made their name on photographing musicians and, and actors and celebrities and so on. Did you, did you consider that to be an advantage for you when you started as a well, photographer? You would think so, but my world was completely different than you would think. My family basically in disinherited me when I wanted to be a photographer because I had a fast track to millions if I chose my father's way, which was finish in Yale and then go to work with my uncle in stocks and bonds. And I had no interest in that. And I announced to him when I got out of the army that I'm going to art school. And he said, well, kid, you're on your own. And so I completely divorced my family in the sweetest way. Still loved them. I understood who they were and that uh, what they wanted for me. But I wouldn't live their life. And so I wasn't going to put on a suit and tie and go to Wall Street for anything. For, yeah. I don't care if I made a million dollars the first year. So what happens is I go to art school and I have no money. My parents actually disinherited me. And I had probably 50 bucks left over from the army. I couldn't buy a camera. A good camera was about $125 in those days. Yeah. But I had a mafia girlfriend. Now, I have a long association with the mafia because I grew up in Beverly Hills. So I knew all the people that owned all the hotels. That's the people that I knew. I also knew all the show business people who worked in those hotels, like Dean and Frank and all the others. And I called my group of kids the Brat Pack. And that was our official name, not the Rat Pack. And we were all young, hip kids who know, knew everything about show business. We grew up in it. We were on the sets of all the movies. And we saw all the perfidy and all the lying that was going on in the show business part of it. And the music business, to me, as corrupt as it was, seemed healthy compared to show business. <laughs> okay, a little drugs here and there I can live with. Mm -hmm. But so what happens is I have a next-door neighbor, Doris Day, and her son was my best friend, Terry Melcher, his name was. And he knew that I was taking pictures and studying photography. He said, Guy, I know you're a great photographer. Let's do an album cover together of this group that I'm working with. And I had never done a professional job before. And he said, this will be for Columbia Records. And I go, okay, I'll do it, whatever it is. He says, well, I want to date this girl, Connie Clemish, a little surfer girl. And who didn't want to? She was gorgeous, right? So I go, okay, I get it. Well, he says, let's use her on the cover with the Fantastic Baggies, this group that I'm producing. And they had a hit record. And so I did the album cover. I put a, a car on the beach with surfboards on top and the group hanging out watching Connie Clemish walk by, and that was the cover. And Columbia Records liked it so much, they go, oh my God, we've got a photographer on the West Coast who can do album covers for us. I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. I just knew they paid me. I couldn't believe it, 500 bucks. It was a lot of money to me. I could buy a camera, all that. So uh, I thought I would do that, but 
I didn't actually do that because I was still in school until a friend of mine and of Terry Melcher's, Lou Adler, I'm playing basketball with him, and he says, I hear you're this great photographer. It helped my career, no doubt about it. And working with the Stones and going to the recording studios and all that was a thrill because they were into the blues, and I am a nut for the blues. Yeah, I was hearing a story about your dad getting you a crystal radio and how you would tune into the... Uh, oh, that's true, yeah. Tune into the... Uh, it's the only thing he ever gave me in my life, yeah. honest to God, was a crystal set that I had to build with earphones. And I listened to the blues every night, rocking my head in bed to this blues. And I heard people like uh, Buddy Guy when he was a kid, Muddy Waters. And it was all on a channel called... Dolphins of Hollywood. Now, unless you were black in the city, in L.A., in the early and late 50s, you wouldn't have known. But it was the station that played what was called race music. That was the term used in those days for black music. And Johnny Ace was one of the greatest singers who was killed by his girlfriend for f Around. And uh, she shot him and killed Johnny Ace, one of the greatest singers of his time. And I knew everybody. I knew all the songs. I remember the song, You Upsets Me, Baby. A great song. I didn't know what it meant. I was too young. But it goes, she's 32 in the waist, 36 in the bust, 36 in the hips. You upsets me, baby. <laughs> and I'm going, what does that mean? Why would that upset him? I don't get it, right? And so I learned that was B.B. King when he was a young man. And going, oh my God, that's a great song. And then I heard the Stones, their first recordings, and they were singing the blues because right. they learned the blues from the black blues artists that sang with them in different shows like... Certain blues guys like uh, Big Bill Brunzi. Have you ever heard that no, name? I've heard that name. Write it down. Everybody write it down and listen to Big Bill Brunzi. And then, um, who else should you? Well, I know everybody. Forget it. I don't want to get started on that. I, oh, how about, uh, oh, forget it. I have so many names in my brain. No, it's okay. Yeah. But if you ever need to know who to listen to, I've got it all from the 50s and 60s. Because Big Joe Turner used to come to my house, and he was the first real blues man who transferred over to rock and roll, singing songs, you know, shake, rattle, and roll, things like that. Okay, enough of that. So I listened to the blues, and I loved the Rolling Stones because of it, but then I found somebody who could sing the blues, and he wasn't a blues singer. He was a white guy from northern England named Van Morrison and he sang Gloria G-L-O-R-I-A Gloria she upsets me okay <laughs> and Van Morrison could sing the blues he had the best gospel blues voice of a white guy and I adored him and I've collected every album of his ever since I know every song and I've got, I don't go to shows unless I get backstage passes and a limousine because I'm tired of rock and roll shooting pictures on stage. But for him, I would go to his sessions and his concerts. Listen to Van Morrison. Listen carefully. Okay. Enough, enough said. One of the neat techniques that I heard you talk about when it came to photographing groups as a way of sort of disarming them was to start doing the portraits first, first before doing the group shots. Why? I'll tell you, that's that a great work? story. And I, I came up with that. First of all, I grew up in show business at movies, and I watched how directors worked. And alone with the actor, they could get a lot more than if he's in the group Mm -hmm. And I watched that. That was so interesting to me. So I got the Rolling Stones, well, and the Doors in my studio. And I said, look, I'm going to do individual portraits first. And when I did, they were disarmed. They were so used to being a group for protection, joking around mm -hmm. 
with the group and being needled by the group it kept him laughing and all that so I got I started with Mick and I got him to relax and shoot and I have this great picture that's up there on the wall of Mick that I love yeah. when we were both 19 years old and then I shot the rest of the guys too it's in their book uh, The Rolling Stones The Retrospective which I got thank God, paid $50,000 for the use of my photographs. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so I made it up. i got to tell Andrew when I see him for the 500 that he paid me, <laughs> I had made 50000 off the pictures. So that's a funny story. But anyway, that's how it started. And then I did the same with the doors. But the funny story about the doors is I went to see them at the whiskey, and I really liked them. And I didn't know much about them, but Elector called me and said, I want you to shoot our new group, The Doors, and I'm sending them to you. And after I'd seen them perform, they come walking in, and they're wearing terrible clothes for 60s rock and roll. Mm -hmm. They were like Venice Beach, off the rack, bad stuff with ribbons and stuff like that. And I made Jim take off his shirt. So that's where those nude shots are, the topless yeah. shots of Jim. And he did it. And so I put him on the cover with the naked shoulders. It became a famous cover. It's still one of my most famous covers. But Jim walks in, he goes, hey, guy. I go, who are you? He says, I'm Jim, Jim Morrison. I said, yeah, well, I'm the lead singer. Oh, yeah, you're great. He says, no, no, we went to school together. I just said, what? UCLA, we were in the same class at UCLA. I said, where? Well, in philosophy. And I'm going, oh, my God, the hardest course I ever took was philosophy. <laughs> we had to read a book every night. He said, I know, I went nuts. I couldn't do it, but I got a C. I said, so did I, I got a C. <laughs> because everybody in there was looking for scholarship money, right? Uh -huh. So they were straight A students, and we were C students in philosophy. You know, I, now I know it all. My daughter became a student. I helped her through the class. But back then, you know, I didn't know who Hegel was, you no. know, or Kierkegaard. And I had to read those books every night. Oh, I fell asleep right away. Anyway, that's how Jim and I became friends. And we stayed friends till he died. Mm. And he was one of the last guys with the doors that I saw alive. You were so young when you started this career photographing all these people. But so were the people that you were photographing. Yeah. And so you were all kids. So I think, I, I imagine that that really provided you uh, a level of access and interaction that wouldn't have been available if you were some Older guy middle-aged right. trying to photograph these up-and-coming performers. That's absolutely true, because I connected with these people right away. First of all, I had long hair, a beard, camera bag over my shoulder. I didn't have a lot of assistance in those days. I preferred at the first couple of years working alone because I liked the one-on-one -on -one with these clients. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to you before that sometimes I was shooting three groups a day, early morning, afternoon, and evening. And uh, that was at A&M. So I was working full time. I was exhausted. I built a studio at my house by the way, I eventually had enough money to buy an estate in Beverly Hills. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Every rocker that made money wanted to buy my house. I had horses. I had a photo studio, a guest house. There was a two-bedroom guest house. Yeah. A Japanese farmhouse with thatched roof. It was quite something. You did well for yourself. Uh, yeah, I made a million dollars the second year. Some of your images, especially the early ones, were done in the outdoors. I think back to the uh, image that you did for Simon and Garfunkel, for example. Yeah. And you, you talk about the fact that you had a studio at, at some point. Oh, yeah. But was were those early images largely a result of like necessity because you didn't have a studio? Or did you, was that a conscious choice? No, that's a great question. Uh, here's the actual story about that. I wanted to shoot outdoors because everybody related to nature. 
the most uptight rock and roller would be in a beautiful place with trees and a lake and all of that. Everybody got mellow, even Simon and Garfunkel, who were all wound up. But I have a great story. Can I tell the story about yeah, Simon and Garfunkel? Please. It's a great story because Paul Simon could be very arrogant, okay? But we got to talking, and uh, I said, so, you know, who are you guys? He said, well, we have a record on the air right now called Sounds of Silence, and you're shooting the cover. And I go, well, that's great. That's a beautiful song. And I said, did you know that my father was a famous songwriter too? And he's a Dickensian scholar. And Paul said, that's what I've been studying in London. I'm a Dickensian scholar. I go, well, I want to introduce you to my father. So my father hated rock and roll. He was writing songs like Love is a Many Splendored Thing. Your listeners may not know these. Uh, Somewhere My Love from Dr. Zhivago. Mm -hmm. Tons of songs, all big romantic songs. So he didn't understand rock and roll. I tried to introduce it to him. So I bring Paul and Art over to my father's house after the shooting. And I said, hey, Dad, here's a Dickensian scholar right from school in London, Paul Simon, who's a great songwriter. And my father says, oh, what have you written? And Paul says, I could sing the song that's on the air right now for you. And my dad said, well, I'd love to hear it. And he says, let me run out to the car and get my guitar. So he gets his guitar, sits down on the couch and sings with art in perfect harmony, sounds of silence. And my father was so impressed. He said, oh my God, that's an erudite song. That's sophisticated and beautiful and hypnotic. Congratulations. And they loved my dad for that mm. because he didn't like most songs. I played Gloria for him, yeah. you know, of Van Morrison. God, that's awful. What is that song? And I said, you don't get it, do you? And so, uh, but then I used to play him, I was an opera nut, and so I'd play him opera, make him crazy. <laughs> I hate that. Okay, so anyway, that's how I became friends with Art and Paul, and they love the cover. That's the one where they're turning over their shoulder, and, yeah, and yeah. you see it's walking down a road with their scarves blowing outdoors. If I'd shot them in the studio, as Avedon did, which was great, it would have been very staid and staged, and that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted people to let loose, and my I'm just going to release some more photographs of Simon and Garfunkel this year for a big show that I'm doing in Texas, Austin, Texas. So when did you find your, when did you find it practical to use the studio as opposed to be out? Oh, I did a lot of studio work, you know, at A&M and I had a studio there. You know, I shot in the studio all the time because what I would do is bring people back for the studio shots after I got them relaxed, got them a little high, oh, good having man. fun. <laughs> and I always carried a little something to drink, you know, like tequila or something with me in my wagon, you know, and just to loosen things up a little bit. And most of them were high when they came anyway. The stones were so high when we went out and shoot those covers. You know, I had to move them around physically. <laughs> I swear to God. And I didn't mind. I, they were great. In the, in the, in the picture of the, the doors, that, that composition with Jim prominently in the foreground and the other three in the background. They hated that. Yeah, we can imagine. Yeah. But the design um, was part of your concept. It wasn't that just that you were taking the pictures, you handed it over to someone and someone else came up with the design. No, I, do that it was, all. I designed all the covers yeah. and the words of everything. So what happened with that is I knew that picture of Jim would sell the album. I had been shooting enough at A&M to know the ones that sold were portraits, maybe studio portraits of the entertainer, the singer, black, white, or Chicano, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's what sold the cover. Because this is a weird story. I shot a cover for Herb Alpert. And the cover was beautiful. But his portrait wasn't on it. And it didn't sell. And the guys at the studio came to me and said, we have to do something. We have to change the cover. And it's not selling because... It's a gorgeous cover, beautifully designed, and we went crazy on it. So I changed the shot to a portrait, and it sold. Yeah. And I learned that lesson. When I did my magazine, Wet, they wanted me to shoot 
a little art piece for the cover. I said, wait a minute, let me shoot this beautiful Miss Santa Monica with blue eyes, a black and white picture on the cover, and it'll sell. And they go, yeah? I said, yeah, I promise you. I've been doing this long enough. So we put it out, sold out the entire issue. Uh-huh. It's all up here. You remember that. And I have beautiful pictures I'll show you of the people with the masks that I've been doing. The portraits where they're beautiful, that's going to sell the book. Yeah. You, you, you photograph not only musicians, but a lot of uh, actors and other performers. Yeah. Did, and I assume that that naturally came from your reputation for the photographs you were making for the music industry. Right. So tell me about that world, because you were a little familiar with it as a result of just growing up in that in that culture, in that environment. But tell me about how different it was to photograph, say, actors as opposed to musicians. Okay, well, it is different, but I did grow up in that world, and I knew a lot of the actors that I was working with, and I loved them. They're mostly very intelligent, sophisticated. My rock friends were like, we were all children, right, growing Mm -hmm. up, and it was like kids in candy stores. Those guys would go out and buy a Ferrari with the money that they got, not realizing, hey, you don't do that. You put that away. Put it into real estate to make money for you. They didn't understand, and a lot of them lost a lot of money. But in show business, they got managers. Now, finally, later on, rock and rollers got managers. What happened was, starting shooting people, the men were easy to photograph. Okay, you got the camera. Here's my face. Live with it. No makeup, (laughs) nothing. Very few publicists would come with the males. The females, makeup artists, their best friend, their publicist. And, oh, it was trouble because... I became famous shooting beautiful women Mm -hmm. because I retouched everything to make them look young and beautiful. And people would say, but they're not real. I said, that's right. (laughs) We're talking show business here. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the ones of the women here in in my studio, they're all beautiful. I redid everything. I used diffusion on them. I had a technique black and white, how to diffuse the picture and make it look sharp and real at the same time. I never taught anybody how to do it. I've been teaching my guy, my assistant, how to do it now so he can carry it on. But it's there's a lot of technique so it doesn't look overdone. And the lighting is everything for women. Men can take side lighting, you know, midday lighting, anything. Like this one of Jack over here. Jack Nicholson. Yeah. That's in the shade at Paramount Studios. He just gave me a great look. And that was the shot. I maybe did three shots, and I've been using that for 50, 60 years. Yeah, I've heard heard you say that he is one of the better people to photograph because he knows to give you something. Oh, he's the best. And Jack is intelligent, sophisticated, a brilliant guy. And we had a lot of fun together. But he would always give you something to use. He instinctively knew that. He was a director, too. Mm -hmm. And, like, he gave me that look. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, so. And there were other guys who had a little of that in them, too. Burt Reynolds, he gave you something. He worked with you. Yeah, a lot of guys, they gave you some sexuality. They weren't afraid of it. And with the women, I would say, I want you to, this is terrible to say, but I want you to look at me like you want to f*** me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Seriously, I would say just that because that's what I wanted from them, something in the, behind their eyes that was not just posing, mm-hmm. but something intelligent. And I would always ask them, ask me a question, something deep and personal. And they'd start to think, and I'd get some intelligence behind the eyes. Right. And that's how I shot women. Yeah, I don't think you could get away with uh, that first statement. Today. Oh, I can do it. <laughs> no, I don't care. Hey, what are they going to do to me at my age? I mean, I've already died and come back to life. You know, do me, do me. What can you do to me, Frank Sinatra? <laughs> Guys and dolls. In the early seventies, you know, you were successful. You, you, had, you had no shortage of work. Um, you'd earn a good amount of money. You married your kids, and you took a break from all this. Yeah. And you know, I know a lot of photographers who were successful and 
the idea of walking away from success is something they could even imagine doing. Why did you do it? Okay, I'm not like other photographers. I don't care about something after I die that they love what I do and did. Mm -hmm. It means nothing to me. But there was a movie called Holiday where Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn go off while he's just graduated from architectural school. And he goes, I want to do six months in Europe. This is my one chance to do it. And she says, I want to go with you. And the two of them go off. That stuck in my brain. That movie. And I loved it. I married a girl that looked like Catherine Hepburn. Truly. And I said, let's take a break. You know, we've got lots of money. If I lease my house out, I can not work for the rest of my life. This estate... I could get 5000 a month for it, which is back in the 60s and 70s was a lot of money, yeah. okay? And she said, okay, let's go. Anyway, so we went and lived in Spain for a year or two and then moved to Florence in Italy to raise my kids in a really proper school, and I loved it. And I didn't shoot pictures. I took a break. I had retired, really, because I had all this money coming in. I had a car, housekeepers, nannies for the children, everything. And I had a wonderful life. And then I moved to Italy, same thing. In those days, not today, but in those days, you could live on 5000 a month well. Yeah. Today, you would need 50000 a month. But my place right now would rent for 50000 a month if I kept it. So I knew the rest of my life. I was taken care of. So that gave me the confidence to leave. And I had to say goodbye to a lot of clients, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, because they all wanted me. I, no, I need you to shoot me. I, I'm up for this. I'm up for that. Anyway, I just left. And some of them came out to visit me. You know, like Goldie Hawn came to the farm in Spain. People like that. It seems like with a lot of the people who you photographed, you guys became friends. Oh, there you are. It's a whole wall of friends. Yeah. And one of the guys that I loved was James Coburn. We stayed friends, but he died, and I was upset. That mm. guy was a sweetheart. He married his prostitute. I Yeah, I loved him for that. <laughs> I did. She was great. <laughs> and I liked her. She was doing nude yoga in the backyard while I was photographing him in the house. That's his picture there yeah. on the wall, the naked picture. She came in and said, Guy, why don't you come and join us? Take your clothes off and we'll do yoga together. And I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I was a free spirit, but not that but not free. That free. <laughs> There's so many people who would, especially young, when they get that success, especially early on, blow their money on booze, drugs, women, spending it on a huge honorage or, you know, just making sort of foolish mistakes. Yeah. And why do you think that that wasn't your, your path? Well, I grew up with parents that were tighter than tight. They had grown up during the downfall of the stock market. They lived through it, mm -hmm. and they held on to whatever they had. And my father was very rich with all these Academy Awards and songs that were classics, blues songs, too. He wrote some great blues songs. And um, I watched them, and I got the hint that this could happen again. And it did mm -hmm. in the United States. And things went bad, but I always had backup. I decided to have two or three businesses. So I bought my father's company, a music publishing company, with my brother. I bought real estate in case there's a downturn in this part of the market. And I, I got rid of my stocks because I didn't like the idea that they could bottom out. I made a lot of money in stocks when it was good, but I sold them all when I felt it wasn't going to be so good. Yeah. And I just kept, and then I bought motorcycles, 400 motorcycles as investments, and that paid off tremendously. I bought bikes for $8,000 new, sold them for $50,000 used. That's what happened. Yeah. And like the car market now is insane. A Porsche 356 that I bought for $3,000 in 
in the 60s is now worth just a 356 is worth 100,000 base up to three or 400,000 depending upon the condition. Now that's going to toil it in no time at all. So I'm not buying it. I bought this one car here just to hold on to. But I'm not going to invest in cars or motorcycles. That world is over. You have to move to the next thing. You got a great story about, I guess, maybe the first motorcycle that you ever owned that was given to you. Is that right? No. That wasn't the first one that... uh Dean Martin gave you? Oh, no. That was my second one. I bought the first one okay. for like $600, which was a Triumph <laughs> yeah, 200 single piece of junk. No, that's true. Dean Martin was a good friend, and uh, he was more like a father to me than my own father. My father gave me nothing my whole life, and that was okay. So I crystal loved- radio. Yeah, crystal radio. <laughs> but I loved him. I didn't care. I knew who he was, you know? Yeah. Being a Buddhist all those years, I started Buddhism when I was 19. You learn to love everybody, even Donald Trump. I love him for all the pain that he's in. You know, he'll, in the next lifetime, he'll come as a beetle. But <laughs> sometime he's going to come back as a sentient being, hopefully. Okay, that's my thing. So um, Dean calls me up and says, Guy, come on up here. I go, what's up, Dean? He says, they're bringing me a motorcycle, a Triumph Bonneville, custom, as a gift. I said, who's doing that? Triumph Motorcycles. Okay, I'll be up there. So I drive up, and he shows me the bike. And on the tank, it's an aluminum tank. It says Dino, stenciled in, an aluminum tank, special single seat, special exhaust. Anyway, gorgeous. And he has to ride it up his driveway to be photographed. He pulls up at the end of the drive and he goes, Guy, come here. What is it? He says, I want you to have this as a present. I can't ride it. You know, I've got this show on CBS. I'm not allowed to ride a motorcycle nor go skiing. That's in the contract. I said, well, what do you want me to do? Just hold it for you? No, it's yours. It meant nothing to him, Mm -hmm. a motorcycle, you know. He was buying for his kids Lamborghinis and Ferraris and things like that. He had a lot of money. He was called Make a Million Martin. That was his nickname. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And he was a good guy. And I played tennis with him and all of that. So I was a great tennis player, by the way. It's another story. So anyway, he gives me the motorcycle, and I'm the proudest guy in the world. And, you know, I drive it everywhere. It's no longer cars for me. It's motorcycles. That's got me hooked. And then I bought an Italian bike to go along with it. By this time, I'm making a lot of money. So I get this little MV Agusta that nobody could start. I said, I'll work on it. And I took it all apart. And I found out the ground wire was misplaced. And I just put the ground wire on a piece of of the telaio, it's called in Italian, Mm -hmm. the frame. And I just took away the paint there and put it on top of it, started right up. Wow. And that's it. That's how I got hooked on Italian bikes. And then they got too sophisticated because I couldn't adjust them. The Ducatis had a desmodromic system that you had to shim and do all these things to. I couldn't do that. So I would go to a guy. Well, these guys did it, you know. So that's what happened. And then I got hooked on Italian bikes because I lived in Italy and I bought... And MV Agusta, a big one, traveled around Europe on this bike. There, people dressed beautifully. Leathers that cost thousands of dollars. Yeah. You know, boots, goggles, helmets. They would tour all these guys, these wealthy guys, the prince of so-and-so, the king of Spain, drove an MV Agusta. So I had to get one, and I drove all over the... uh, Mediterranean to my home in Spain to my home in Italy on MVs and I would stop at great restaurants and have beef steak and french fries it was incredible <laughs> life I lived a life I'm not even talking about the life I lived it was incredible mm-hmm. everybody I knew everybody when, when you came back you started uh, a magazine yeah tell me about that and what that provide, provided you creatively that you hadn't had before. 
Okay, that's interesting. It's a good story. It's true. It's apocryphal. Here's what happened. I was living in Italy, reading Time magazine every week. And every week I would go to people, the part of Time magazine that interested me the most. And God, there's my friend so-and-so. Oh, they're getting a divorce. Oh, my God, you know, like that. I found out about all my friends through People magazine during the entertainment section there, right? So I go, God damn it, I should start a magazine called People. Time magazine didn't do it. So I call up a couple of friends, high-end rollers, rich, way beyond me, in the billion dollar category, right? I said, you want to start a magazine? I've got this idea. I know it's a hit. It's called People, um, okay? We do stories on people around the country and show business people, real in-depth stories with great photographs. And they go, yeah, let's do it. That's the guys who owned big companies. Fairchild, do you ever hear the name oh, Fairchild? Yeah. yeah, he was one of the guys. Anyway, so we're putting together the money and all of that, and we buy a magazine so that we can turn over all of the advertising that's already in this magazine, and we can start to use that. And so the word gets out that the three of us are starting a magazine called People. Time magazine quickly puts out People magazine to undercut us. Mm. And that was the end. We could no longer do it. So we sold our magazine and went on our way. So a friend of mine at UCLA was a very talented architect, designer, love him, one of my best friends. And he had a little rag, two-page rag, that he called his magazine that he did at UCLA. And I knew there was something there. It was called Wet the magazine of gourmet bathing. And I'm going, this is a great thing. This can be turned into a real magazine, make money. Little did I know the amount of work that it takes to put out a magazine. So I sign on with him, Leonard Gorin, this wonderful friend. And we put, I put a little money in. He's got some money in it. Somebody else put some money in. And then we get some big money in. And we produce it. And it becomes one of the hottest art magazines in the country. Sold at museums, special places, uh, magazine racks. You could buy it. It became very hip and beautiful. And we got great people to write for us. Top-notch writers like Bukowski. Oh, so many different people. And um, it's getting to be popular. And all of a sudden we realize... Everybody who's working for us is making money, except us, because we have to keep reinvesting, and we keep reinvesting, and finally we get a mega guy who invented the computer chip to put money in, so then we expanded, and we color covers and all of that stuff, and then it got to be like real work, and neither of us could handle it. He met a Japanese girl who was from a rich family. He said, I think I want to move to Tokyo. I go, okay, I'm going to move to Ojai. And we close the magazine. Mm. So one day we're going to do a retrospective. That's what our joke. And I've got the pictures for it. And he does too. So we might do that. Did you get to make photographs that were somehow different than what you had made before as a result? Everything of was control? different. Absolutely. How so? I could do whatever I wanted. My girlfriend was the editor. Okay? So... We would get ideas. Let's do noseworthy people instead of newsworthy. Okay. No, and we did a whole thing of noseworthy people where I photographed people with great noses and uh, put them all into an article, and all black and white because we had to keep the cost down. Inside was black and white, and outside we did co color covers. And I still have all the magazines. They're beautiful and they're collectible now. You have to pay a lot of money for them online. So that was it. It was fun. And I quit and he quit and we closed it. And people are upset because yeah. it was the only thing that talked to the modern generation of young artists. And what we did was we'd give somebody a page. Hey, you're a designer. You want a page of your own? 
design a page, take a photograph, do a piece of artwork, whatever you want. It's yours, or two pages. And people love that. The artists were enthralled by getting the chance to do that. And we did a lot of things with performance artists, like the Kipper Kids. You're too young to remember them, but they were one of the best of the uh, performance artists. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of performance art, put the money behind it, and did stories on it. And Bob and Bob worked for us. They were artists who painted together. Wonderful work. And we just had fun. Then we did a great shot that I photographed all the apostles sitting at the table with Leonard as the publisher. Yeah. And we did it just like the, the one that's in Milan. Do you know the one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was so funny. I look at it today, I can't believe we did it. But uh, we had the Jesus, that was Leonard. I think I was the Baptist. We were all there. And it was fun, and we just did anything we wanted to do. You you know, photographers or anybody who's creative has a a long career. You can have your ups and downs, your you know your high points and your low points. For some, it's financial. Sometimes it's creative burnout. What was a time like that for you, and what helped you to get out of it? Okay, well, there's a point where I felt it was wrong for me to participate in certain fashion. I did a lot of fashion for Glamour and different magazines, and I worked for Esquire, things like that. When it became lesbian and homosexual, and it was overt photographically, I stayed away from that. I had nothing against it. Um, You know, I have a lot of, half of my friends are gay, female and male, my brother and all that, so... That wasn't it. It was I didn't promote that kind of unattractive sexuality, all tattooed, all that. And I was kind of a prig in that way. And now I think I could do it. But back then I felt I couldn't do it. I was married to a very strange, wonderful woman whom I'm married to today. And she doesn't like that kind of stuff. And she's very anti-tattoo and I said God get over it get (laughs) over it I don't have tattoos because of her I would have had them but I respected her feelings so I didn't do that kind of work and I didn't do a lot of nudity which I had every woman wanted to have a nude done of them when they were young and beautiful and they would ask me and I'd kind of put it off because it gets a little too intimate and the husbands get uptight and all that Mm -hmm. But I still do it if somebody's a friend. I'm doing a couple this next week. So you had a stroke a few few years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. So at some point that stopped you from being creative. Um, But more recently, as we're seeing here, you're set up back in a studio. And tell me about the challenge of getting yourself back physically to the point that you're now photographing again. Okay, this is very simple. I woke up, I was still alive, then the doctor told me I had died on the table, and I was brought back to life. I'm going, God, brought back to life? How amazing. And I had women that loved me, my wife was a very good caretaker, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my life? I can't hold a camera, I I can't, I'm doing rehab, what am I going to do? And I said, well, I have plenty of money, so what I'll do is share it with my kids, which was never done for me with my parents. What a difference that's going to be while I'm alive to give them money for houses and things like that. And then I'm going to be way more loving to all my friends. I'm going to let them know that I love them, and I'm going to hug them and kiss them. It was a big change. Not that I didn't do that before, but now I'm going to be over the top Mm -hmm. and to tell my male friends how much I love them. Being a Buddhist, it was very easy to understand that. And when you start to love those that you think you might hate, that changes everything. And you become a more beautiful person. And because of this, I have so many, easily a hundred friends here in Ojai and maybe 60 to 100 friends in Martha's Vineyard and friends in Italy and friends in Spain that love me and they let me know. 
so sweet. I just got a message from somebody from New York, how much they love me and can't wait to shoot with me now that I'm back shooting yeah. like that. And so she wants to do nudes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's the story. So were you just determined to sort of get back to it and just throw yourself into recovering immediately? or what, what? Immediate is, is impossible. When you have a stroke that really is, your left arm doesn't work. Your left leg doesn't work. You have to make it work. Now, I'm showing you this, where I can get my left arm now up over my head. Mm -hmm. That's new. I couldn't get it up over this. Oh, so now, chest, yeah, you're you know. seeing it. So that took me a year. Walking without help with this walker took me two years. Getting in and out of the car took me another six months. So all these things are on the way to healing. And in my life coming up, I will heal. And that's all. That's all I can say. I'm determined. And I have wonderful women that I work with in the water. It's called Watsu. If you're ever deb debil debilitated, do Watsu. And tell us about the, the project that you're working on, the pictures that you showed me. Yeah, okay, we well, uh, this is a project that I, you know, my wife hates it because she thinks, oh, it's so foolish. What are you doing? Because she's conservative. Not like me at all. I'm completely wild up here. <laughs> she's not. And she's very conservative and very sweet and loving. So... We come back from Santa Barbara where we're hiding out during the fires here in Oi. And we come back and the fires are still going and everybody's wearing a mask. The whole town, there isn't anybody that doesn't have a white mask on or a black mask or something. And I'm going, God, who are these people? I don't even know who's behind the mask. So I thought, God, what an interesting thing that would be. I did something like that years ago for Wet Magazine, shooting people with masks. And it was fascinating. All these artists came with interesting masks. I said, I think I should do that again with Ojai people. And I think they would all like to contribute because it's their art that's going to be on display. So um, I started with a couple of people doing it with my new studio here. And they loved it. And everybody said, oh, I want to do some. And every artist said, yeah, I'll do some. And it was like that. And all of a sudden, I had 100 people doing this and I'm going to do a book and a show and sell the pictures to all the people not for a lot of money just to cover my cost because it's going to cost me thousands of dollars <laughs> to print all these things that's what it's all about and I'm thrilled that I did it and even my wife is getting a little more familiar with it you know oh that's interesting you know that kind of a thing fun. yeah we had a book that came out a couple of years ago yeah in three tell, years ago. Tell me about the, that process, because you have so much work that it must have been an interesting experience to revisit not only the images that you're famous for, but images that you likely had not even looked at or considered for, for decades. What was that process like? That's the best question anybody has ever asked me, because that's an amazing thing. I hadn't seen these pictures for like 50 years. They're all on my li online, mm -hmm. you know, and I have them all saved. But the book publisher didn't want the art of my art, which I have a lot of. The book publisher didn't want f people that weren't famous. I'm going, oh, okay. What, what about all the students I've been photographing for years? Because I taught photography and I photographed all these students, beautiful pictures. Nope. Nothing like that. So I said, I have to get probably the top 200 pictures or whatever it is. And that was confining for me because I love the artwork that I've done through the years and the people that I've photographed. Like before I got sick, I photographed people in Venice, people that worked for a living. That's what I called it. Women that had jobs, artists, filmmakers, tattoo artists, everything. I photographed them with their work, and I'm so proud of that. And I did that with men, famous men who did artwork and portrait painters and all of that. 
anyway, that's what started my doing groups like that. So that's why this became second nature. Yeah. But what happened was I started looking at the pictures, 40,000 pictures. Wow. You know, 60 years, well, 50 years yeah. when I started this. That's a lot of time going by. And I found pictures of I thought were celebrities. And I showed it to the publisher and they go, man, nobody knows who that is. I said, are you kidding? She was one of the biggest stars in the world, Rita Hayworth. Well, that's from 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Now, we need something more contemporary. I'm going, wait a minute. You're asking me to do a book of nostalgia and all these people, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about famous actors and actresses. Joseph Cotton, one of the great actors yeah. of the world who did some of the great movies with Orson Welles. They didn't go for it. And I was I felt stiltified, but I did it. But the book got and it sold well. It's completely sold out. The only way you can get it is to go on Amazon and look for used ones. And there are used ones. And they're cheap. You can get a used one for fifteen dollars. They sold originally for seventy five. So I've got five left and they're for my five children. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Okay. Well, I do have one. I went to see him and he helped me with my career, Irving Penn. Mm -hmm. I think of him as my favorite photographer of all times. Now, there are others that are equally as good, but he struck a chord for me, the way he photographed women, so beautiful in the studio, so elegant, and he did all those working class people. Yeah. And he took backgrounds to Africa and photographed all the Africans, so beautiful. And I went to see him, I said, Irving, would you ever consider hiring me as your assistant? I, I know everything about lighting now and all of that. By the way, I worked at Fox Studios for a while before I became a photographer in the lighting department. Uh -huh. And I got, not because of my father. My father worked at Fox Studios, but I, he didn't know who I was. I walked in, I said, I know all about lighting. He said, <laughs> you want to work here? I said, yeah, for the summer. So he gave me a job for the summer. I made enough money to go through college on my own without using my father's money because I knew there was none there. I couldn't believe it. That's the way my whole life has been. With the mafia, with the studios who have helped me, the guy who gave me my first camera was a famous film producer. He gave me his Nikon with a 50 millimeter lens. I went out and shot pictures with it at Fort Ord of the Mexican immigrants working in the fields, mm -hmm. took that to Art Center and they said, oh my God, you shot these on one roll of film? I didn't know you could shoot more than one picture. <laughs> I didn't. And they said, well, you're coming here. You're coming here. And they let me in before I could pay. And they did. And it started my career. That's Along great. with the mafia. <laughs> That's how my life went. But anyway, Irving Penn, his images are so beautiful. And he was doing something that I really enjoyed. He heated up his color film during development, mm -hmm. and the grain spread apart, and it was beautiful. It was like pointillism. And I had studied art. I got my master's in Renaissance art in Italy. So, you know, I was educated about art. So all that worked for me as an artist and a photographer. And that's what happened. Uh, I, I saw his images, and then he shot with the Hasselblads and things like that, too. And he said, now listen, guy, I'm giving you the best advice I can. Don't come work for me, otherwise you're gonna look like me. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when people work for another photographer. They take on their technique. You should go back. He loved my work, by the way. I showed it to him. He said, you go back to California. If I could start over, I would work in California. You've got the light all year long. The evening light, the morning light in California is beautiful. In New York, we've got snow half the year. You can't shoot outside. It's raining, snowing. And he was right. Mm -hmm. And within a year, I had Dunnell Records. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, 
Guy, thank you so much for your time. What a pleasure. Great talking to you. Each week, we have a segment in the show where I share my thoughts, ideas, and memories that may or may not involve photography. We call it The Last Frame. I was talking to a photographer the other day, and we were talking about what inspires us. We both agreed that a big part of our inspiration comes from looking at other people's photographs. But not images created just by any photographer, but instead, photographers who found a unique and special way of seeing the world. Many of my personal heroes are photographers who were at their peak before the age of digital. They didn't have access to high megapixel count cameras with insane bit depth or autofocus. They often worked with cameras that would seem prehistoric to many people today. But these photographers succeeded in creating images that became a part of my life. Because even though I wasn't physically there, I have memories of people and events that I became a witness to because of a photograph. There are certain images that I never tire of looking at. These are images that I return to over and over again, not just because they're beautiful, not just because I want to figure out how the photographer made that shot, but because there is something in that image that just moves me. Sometimes I don't exactly know what it is about that photograph that seduces me. But when I look at those images, it doesn't matter. I just look at that photograph and I'm taken in all over again as if I'm seeing it for the very first time. There's a pleasure I experience with those photographs. It's especially important because so much of my professional life has been about evaluating and critiquing photographs, taking them apart, trying to understand the technical side of how a photographer created the image. There's a dispassionate dissection that has been a big part of how I see images. And I've done it so much for so long, it's easy to forget the pleasure that I can have when I discover a new photograph that completely captures my attention. There are several images that do that for me. It's not just because they're beautiful or even technically perfect because some of those images have their flaws but it's something about these photographs that draw me back over and over again in 1967 William Albert Allard was sent out by National Geographic to photograph the Basque people in Europe it was only a few years since his first assignment for Nat Geo and only three years since he had seriously begun photographing in color He was a relatively new photographer who was learning the nuances of color transparency film with its low ISO and limited dynamic range. This was his first time in Europe, and as is his way then and now, he wandered the streets looking for photographs. He walked through markets, stores, homes, photographing people, people he didn't know, but who he came to know intimately through the lens of his camera. And it was during this time that he made one of his most memorable photographs. And those two little girls running down that Basque Village Road in 1967, I made two frames. Uh, I had turned, I'd heard these little patter of feet coming down the gravel. I heard a woman in the village had called out, and a few seconds later I heard this sound, and I turned, I see these two children. I raised my Leica. And I made two frames. And I got that rare gut feeling that I thought, Allard, if you didn't screw that up, that could be nice. (laughs) Well, two months later, I get back. I'm going through my film. There's two frames. One was blur, just nothing. And I trashed. I wish I hadn't trashed it now. I wish I still had it. The other one was magic. Bill Allard is a photographer who is famous for how he uses color and light. And while this image possesses those things, what comes to mind for me has nothing to do with how the image looks. 
What fascinates me is that this image was inspired by a sound. The sound of a mother calling out to her children. It's a sound that we're all familiar with, regardless of country or culture, race or language. It's a sound that holds out the promise of security and love. It was that sound that inspired Bill to turn around and expose those two frames of film. I sometimes think that I'm too myopic, too focused on those visual triggers that lead me to create a photograph. I'm always looking for light and shadow or line and shape. And sometimes I fear that my inspiration or the source of my inspiration has become too finite, too limited, and that I don't consider all the other possibilities that may be out there. This photograph reminds me of those other possibilities. That what I hear or smell, touch or taste, give me the spark that inspires a photograph. A photograph, even though it's this two-dimensional thing, it doesn't have to be completely detached from the things that make life rich and diverse and fulfilling. The photograph can, in its own unique and almost magical way, reveal something beyond itself. It can be more than just a photograph. So I keep looking and making photographs. And I look forward to those new moments where the world is revealed to me in a way that just isn't possible otherwise. And when that moment arrives, whether through the lens of my own camera or someone else's, I'll welcome it. And I will love it for the special thing that it is. And that's the last frame. Thanks to Guy for spending time with us, and a special thanks to Bill Nation of Pro Italia Motorcycles for his help in making this interview happen. To find out more about Guy and his work, visit GuyWebster.com. If you're a fan of The Candid Frame, take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. It helps our ranking, but it also creates awareness of the show. Though it only takes a few minutes, you will be making a huge difference. Take the time to do it today. Thanks to Saintly68 and Alex Doig, both of the UK, for their five-star reviews. I really appreciate it. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you help us to meet the cost of production and help us to bring you these episodes each week. You can also make a one-time contribution via PayPal. It's your support that helps us to bring you conversations that you won't hear anywhere else. Do it today. Thanks to Rui Estevez for his recent contribution. I can't thank you enough. It was your support that allowed us to create the free Candid Frame app, which is the easiest way to access every episode of the Candid Frame. Available for Apple iOS and Android, you automatically receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet. And you can easily search for episodes based on a keyword or name and save your favorite episode for repeated listening. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, and you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at X. And this is X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>